Okay, we're going to now discuss the different types of orbits and how they might undergo orbital decay. Firstly, the course requires us to do in detail two types of orbits. The firstly, a low Earth orbit, also known colloquially as a LEO, L-E-O, low Earth orbit. And um, we define that as a satellite which orbits between 200 and 2,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth. So it's best just to remember that, you know, around about the 1,000 kilometre mark, plus or minus 1,000, um, as long as you're not in the atmosphere. So uh, it's, they're quite close to the Earth, and because they're close to the Earth, they have only a short period. On average, if you average that range out and use Kepler's law, you'll find that the period of, of LEO has approximately a period of one and a half hours. So that means it orbits the Earth every one and a half hours or about 90 minutes. Um, the atmosphere uh, extends only around about 100 kilometres into space um, at the 100 kilometre um, mark. Uh, the, if you look outside a spacecraft, it would be black, so you wouldn't actually see atmosphere. Uh, but about 200 kilometres is where you start getting enough vacuum that uh, the orbit does not really um, get too much friction. But nevertheless, at about 200 kilometres and above, we still have atmospheric drag, which means that there are still particles of the Earth's atmosphere which are present and that means that they will slow the craft down and it will make the satellite become, uh, well, it will slow it down and it will just spiral eventually after a period of time back into the Earth's atmosphere and burn up on entry. Um, luckily, our low Earth orbit, uh, not luckily, but it's designed this way, that we know that the upper limit of the Earth's orbit, of the low Earth orbit, is the 2,000 kilometre mark. And the reason why it's 2,000 kilometre mark is because of the inner Van Allen belt. Now, the Van Allen belt is a, a region of the uh, magnetosphere which has trapped high energy particles. And as a result, this area becomes alive and very dangerous to. Um, electronic devices, but it's also part of the mechanism that protects the Earth from um, high-speed uh, cosmic um, particles. So it's quite important to us, but we can't have a satellite, um, unless it's very heavily shielded, orbiting at this level. So that's the reason why it's between 200 and 2,000 kilometres, uh, because above that is the Van Allen belt, and there are two of them. There is an inner and an outer. The inner is around about the 10,000 mark, and the outer is around about the 35 to 40,000 mark. Um, also, the reason why we use a low Earth orbit is that uh, there is a very small time lag. In fact, it's nearly non-existent for communication satellites. When we send out a beam of, of a, any electromagnetic wave, whether it be a radio wave or a microwave, it still takes time, even though it travels the speed of light, to get to the satellite and then return. Um, nearly, in the, when we're talking about satellites in this uh, distance above the surface of the Earth, it's nearly instantaneous. So we don't have much communication lag. There is no uh, large pause if we have two people talking to each other. Uh, we use this uh, orbit, especially for satellites that need to observe the surface of the Earth directly or for communications because of the uh, minimal communications lag. So this is basically the area of the low Earth orbit. So this distance here is around about 200 to 2,000 kilometres. And uh, they have no specific direction for the orbit. You can orbit around in any region you like. Um, you don't have to be over top of the equator, and you'll find out in a few more moments when we talk about the geostationary orbit that it must be above the equator. So the, the 
uh, the beautiful part of the low Earth orbit is that it has a variety of uses. So this is not restricted to the only uses, but these are the most common uses of the low Earth orbit. The first is the GPS satellites. Um, at any time, we need at least four satellites to be um, observed by a GPS system. And so uh, we need to have a short period so that the GP at least four um, satellites are in the sky or above an area at one time. Weather satellites, they um, have to be, well, you don't have to have them in the low Earth orbit, but uh, they often, um, because they are monitoring uh, very uh, quick areas of, um, of Uh, sorry, because um, they are uh, uh, observing very quick events in the weather, that uh, they have to have a, a low Earth orbit just to observe the, the motion of those things. Um, the low, so the Earth observation satellites, these are observation satellites that monitor, for instance, temperatures of the um, surface of the Earth, the uh, uh, any shift in the tectonic plates for earthquakes and so on, as well as the environmental monitoring satellites. These are also uh, things that monitor air temperature. They're very similar to weather satellites. As mentioned before, communication satellites, these are for mobile phones, telecommunications, TV and so on. Um, though the Americans don't like to talk about it too much, spy satellites are also at this level because they have the highest ability to zoom in on people on the ground. Um, and also a lot of scientific equipment. Uh, the ISS is the, um, the abbreviation for the International Space Station. And the International Space Station is approximately 400 kilometers up. And the Hubble telescope as well, that's around about 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Right, the next uh, important one that we have to discuss is the uh, geostationary orbit. Now, geostationary orbit is a much uh, greater orbit. It's an orbit which is further away uh, than the 2000 maximum of the low Earth orbit. Now, what makes it uh, what makes it a very important orbit is that it has a specific period, and the period is that it must have a period of 24 hours. In that case, if we look at the, um, the uh, animation over here, that as the Earth turns, so does the satellite turn with the Earth. So as a result, satellites appear to maintain their position in the sky. The reality is that they are orbiting once a day just as much as the Earth is um, rotating once a day. But because of the, um, the synchronicity between our rotation and the orbit, they, the satellite appears to stay in one spot above the surface of the Earth. To do this, we need to put it at approximately 36,000 kilometres, which is very luckily just below the second Van Allen belt. And so therefore it doesn't do too much damage um, to uh, communication satellites and, and the electronics of satellites at this point. However, there is a problem with the communications lag. It travelling at the speed of light, a beam of radio waves or microwaves or anything will take around about a quarter of a second to go out to this distance and return. So there is a, a quarter of a second gap um, in communications. So this can often cause a problem uh, when we are uh, using it for communications. And you often find that satellite phones and so on, people who are uh, talking and communicating with the satellites in this orbit, they often have to wait. And there's this, um, this uh, communication lag um, that you see on TV often with uh, communications, say, for live telecast uh, from one side of the Earth to the other. So what's the reason that we use this? Um, once again, as, uh, just because they were used in the low Earth orbit doesn't mean we can't use them in the geostationary. So a lot of the uses of the geostationary orbit are the same as the low Earth orbit. Um, once again, we have GPS satellites up there um, that maintains exactly 
uh, satellites in the same position all the time. Weather satellites are quite good at this level, but they are quite static and that because they are so far away, they have a lower resolution of what is going on. Um, once again, we use Earth environmental and observational satellites. Uh, so these are often put out there as long range um, observers of the same uh, position of the same part of the Earth all the time. Remember, geostationary orbits, the satellite would always be looking at the same part of the Earth all the time. And we still use communication satellites for TV, for um, uh, civil casts, for all those type of things, um, telecommunications, as well as uh, TV, as I just said. Um, so for the problem with communications, of course, we have lag problems. So just to summarise what uh, the parts of the um, or where things are, the, uh, this little diagram here is quite good. It shows you where things are in terms of the orbits. Now we have the low Earth orbit right here in the centre around there, and that's remember it's between 200 and 2,000 kilometres. Now they've got these, uh, the scale on this in mega metres, so 10,000 mega metres is another way of saying 10 kilometres. Oh, sorry, 10,000 uh, 10, kilometres, that's what I meant. So let's put in the Van Allen belt. The Van Allen belt is around here. It's got a bit of a darker colour there. Okay. So we have two Van Allen belts and they have a donut shape around the surface of the Earth like that. And we, that's the inner ones and we have an outer one. Now the outer one is actually, does encompass part of the geostationary orbit, but it is only, it's very thick just after it. So even though there is some Van Allen belt um, activity at the geostationary orbit, um, it is mostly uh, active after it. And here is the geostationary orbit around here. So um, these are not the only two orbits. There are miles of other different orbits that are possible. And you can see that we have um, some other famous satellites like the Galileo satellite here. Um, in an orbit which is around about 20,000 kilometres above the Earth and so on. So just keeping in mind the uh, position of the Van Allen belts, the first one is around about one um, altitude of, um, I shouldn't say 1,000, I should say 10,000 to 16,000, there's a missing thing there. And the second outer belt is around about the 37,000 kilometre mark. The Distance for a, um, a, geo, a geostationary orbit is approximately 36,000. So there's about a thousand kilometer uh, distance between the geostationary orbit and the Van Al outer Van Allen belt. Right, um, this is a J track, and the J track, I'll put that up there, just give me a few seconds to move it. Yeah. The J-Track enables you to track the position of the uh, of satellites um, around the Earth in real time. So you can actually move it around and just by simply placing your um, cursor on, okay, and uh, the link is in the description for this. But we can zoom in. I'll just firstly zoom in. Uh, control and click. Okay, so zooming out there, we can see the Earth now um, surrounded by two rings. The inner ring, which is, um, sorry, going back. The inner ring here around the surface is the lower Earth orbit, the, the Leo. And around the outside, we see this large ring. And that large ring is the geostationary orbit. And the choice is most satellites around the Earth are in either one of those two orbits. So let's zoom in onto the, um, oops, wrong one, zooming in to the low Earth orbit. 
and we can see that around the Earth orbit, around the lower Earth orbit, we can see different, um, if I can click on each of these points here, these are different satellites and their trajectory in their orbit. Okay? So you can see that this is approximately um, 1,000 to 2,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth. And this is straight upside down there, you know, and you can turn it around and see it straight again. Okay. Um, then zooming out, again, you can see that there is a definite um, ring above the surface of the equator. Now, that's the equator of the, um, of the, um, the Earth there, and you can see that this ring is above the centre of the equator. So it's not, it's very important that we understand there are two conditions for a geostationary orbit. It's not just that the period has to be uh, 24 hours, but it must also be above the equator. If it's not above the equator, then it's a different type of orbit altogether. So, looking at those two, uh, those two uh, different orbits, the one orbit that has a problem is the low Earth orbit because of orbital decay. Now, orbital decay is the process of prolonged reduction in the altitude of a satellite's orbit. In other words, if you have a look at this diagram over here, the, uh, the satellite starts at a distance above here, also say called the height of altitude there. And as time goes on, it starts to spiral further and further in towards the planet. Eventually, it's going to hit the really uh, thick atmosphere of the Earth and then just plummet straight through it and probably burn up or just strike the surface of the Earth. Now, the reason why this happens is that all satellites in low Earth orbit are subject to some atmospheric drag. In other words, friction with the particles of the atmosphere. Though the atmosphere technically does end approximately 200 kilometres up, there is still a very gentle region of atmosphere out here. Even though there's only a few particles per square metre, it still is over time enough to cause friction and enough to cause the uh, satellite to reduce in altitude and eventually crash into the centre of the Earth, or the centre of the Earth, or the surface of the Earth. Um, now, why does this happen and why does it collapse back down? It comes to, uh, for all the idea of what we call orbital energies. Now, there is a, in your textbook, there is an explanation of how to derive this. This here, epsilon here, is a, what we call the specific orbital energy. You can just calculate the orbital energy um, in terms of joules, but this is the joules per kilogram of the satellite. Now, it's um, the sum of the kinetic energies and the potential, gravitational potential energy. As we know, all satellites have potential, gravitational potential energy, and also, because it's in movement, kinetic energy. And that gives us total mechanical energy. If you divide that by the mass of the kilogram of the satellite, you get epsilon. We also know that the potential energy is a negative value. And so overall, the mechanical value, the mechanical energy of a satellite is, is negative. Now, here we have a look at this column in the centre. This is the specific orbital energy. And let's just take two values here. That's a negative 29, so that's, we'll just say that's negative 30. And this one down here, this is negative 8. Okay? Now, the altitude over here is in kilometres. So this is a lo very low, um, low orbit, and this is a still a low orbit, but it's a medium low orbit. orbit. Now what happens is, as an orbit gets lower and lower, closer to the surface, the value of a specific um, orbital energy, that's epsilon, gets more and more negative. So if you go to a higher orbit, the value rises towards zero. Now, the other thing we've got to remember is, if I lose energy, this number is going to become more negative. So, if I lose energy, 
I am going to have a lower orbit. So the loss of energy means we get a lower orbit. And that is quite important. So what happens is we start with friction with the atmosphere and it causes a loss of energy. And the loss of energy is kinetic energy is converted into heat. This lowers the energy, lowers total energy of the satellite. Now, if I lower the total energy, then my orbital energy decreases as well. In that case, epsilon goes down. When we just discovered that if epsilon goes down, then that means the radius goes down as well, the altitude, the radius of orbit from the centre of the Earth must decrease and therefore the altitude, which is the height, also decreases. So the height of the orbit goes down. As we go towards the surface of the Earth, here's our Earth, and don't forget around the surface of the Earth is a nice thick layer of atmosphere. As we fall closer to the surface of the Earth, we encounter more and more atmospheric friction with more and more particles. And that means that we are going to have increased atmospheric friction. So if we have increased atmospheric friction, then the part, whole thing starts to repeat itself. So with increased friction comes increased conversion into heat and kinetic energy. So increased loss of energy, increase of the lower ring of the orbital energy, and an increase in the loss of altitude. And this cycle continues as we spiral further and further in towards the atmosphere until we actually enter the atmosphere, which then significantly close, um, shuts the process down and we crash um, into the atmosphere. Uh, sorry, into the surface of the Earth. This here is a jumble which is trying to uh, work out which order to place all these things in. And it's just moving this one up so can read it, so can see all these things. So if you want to take a few moments and pause the video, and you can work out what order we should put these in. And then I'll, there are seven statements here and they all form a account for the orbital k in low Earth orbits. So just pause the video and see if you get it right. So take a few moments. Okay, let's see how you went. So first thing is, um, the first is uh, this one here. That is a satellite in a stable or Earth so a stable orbit around the Earth possesses a certain amount of energy, which is the sum of its kinetic and poten gravitational potential energies, and it's called the orbital energy. That's the first statement that we should open with. So that's number one. Okay. Here we go. One. Okay. Then the next statement, which makes sense in order, would be that. Satellites in a low Earth orbit are subject to friction with the outer fringes of the atmosphere. Then number three is, continuing on the theory, the, the um, theme of friction, is that friction results in a loss of energy as kinetic energy is trans transformed into heat. Number four, the loss of kinetic energy means the, sat the satellite slows down in the forward direction, which is the tangential motion. So that would mean that it actually loses kinetic energy in the forward direction. But then number five, as the satellite loses tangential velocity, it no longer has enough energy to stay in its present altitude, and the satellite drops down, because it just plummets towards the centre of the Earth, but it's doing it in such a way that it's a very, very long spiral, down to an altitude that corresponds to its new lower orbital energy. Remembering, as we lower orbital energy, I also have to lower altitude. The next is number six. 
and number six is that over here. As the satellite moves downward, the satellite also increases its velocity as gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. So we are going towards the surface of the Earth, we are dropping, therefore we do actually increase downward direction of, uh, if you want to say downward kinetic energy, but there's no such thing as downward kinetic energy, but um, that's a good way of looking at it. And finally, number seven, this is the process which is called orbital decay. It's a cyclic process. As the satellite's near lower orbit resi um, resides in a slightly denser section of the atmosphere, which leads to a further friction, further energy loss, and the process goes on and goes on. It doesn't just repeat itself, but it repeats itself at a faster and faster rate. Eventually, we would spiral into the surface of the Earth. Okay. So the one thing that we need to be able to do is to calculate the radius of orbit of a geostationary orbit. And the way it is done is that we will use Kepler's law of periods and we want to find the radius of the orbit. So we know that the period is 24 hours. We know that the orbit is around the mass of the Earth as being 5.97 by 10 to the power of 24. And we want to find R cubed. So we need to, um, once you've calculated that, that will be around about 42,000 kilometers. So I'm leaving you to do this yourself. Um, if you want to find the altitude, so that will be R there, uh, then uh, you need to subtract 42,000 minus around about 6,400 kilometers, which is the uh, radius of the Earth down there. Okay. And that will give us about 36,000 kilometers. So take a few moments to do that because you need to be able to calculate the um, radius of orbit of geostationary orbits as well as its altitude. Okay, the other thing we need to be able to do is to fill out a table such as this. Um, you need to know the following information about a um, low Earth orbit and geostationary orbits. Um, make sure that you memorize the approximate altitude, the approximate periods of orbit, and the extent of orbital decay. So we'll go there first to summarize it. We know that low Earth orbits are somewhere between 200 and 2,000 kilometers. Geostationary orbit is a specific value, and it's 36,000 approximately kilometers above the surface of the Earth. The period of orbit of a geostationary orbit is fixed at 24 exact hours, one sidereal day. Um, the period of orbit for uh, a low Earth orbit can be in the matter of maybe 50 minutes all the way up to about two hours. So it's approximately on average one and a half hours. Um, there is very little, nearly none, um, orbital decay for geostationary orbits. Um, and there is a high level of orbital decay for low Earth orbits. You can go back and work out what the uses for satellites in this orbit are, and most of them, these uh, uses for the low Earth orbits are the same as geostationary. The only thing about this is that there is a time lag for communication, which is about a quarter of a second. So don't forget that. Okay. There are, um, though the, uh, the syllabus does not mention them, these have been mentioned in the HSC before and often have confused people. You do not need to know much about um, these following or other orbits. Just realise that they do exist and just be familiar with them as well so that you, um, if they do mention them as a part of a question, you don't get thrown by that. The first one that they have mentioned in the past is a geosynchronous orbit. A geosynchronous orbit is the same, it has the same period as 24 hours as a, um, as a geostationary, but it's not above the equator, and that makes this uh, different. Now, if it's above the equator, it would be geostationary, and the satellite would appear to be stationary in the sky. 
because it is a um, not above the equator, it has a specific shape. It does move in the sky, and it has a figure of eight. And these eight are lazy eights. So they, they look like that. We'll get a better um, pen on that one. So they have figures like that, that way. And you can see one here, which is quite a significant, a, a full lazy eight. But sometimes the, the top part of the eight is depending on the altitude or where the actual uh, orbit is, um, the top part of the eight can be quite small compared to the bottom. Um, the satellite is always, um, as I said, the, name of the proper name for this uh, for the rate is the analemma. Uh, but what's the use of it is that um, the satellite is always in the same position in the sky at the same time of the day. So as the day progresses, we know exactly where it will be. Another one, this is a diagram from your textbook, um, is a transfer orbit. Now a transfer orbit is just a, an elliptical orbit that moves a uh, satellite from one orbit to another. And we need to do that if we're in a low Earth orbit here and we want to go out to a geostationary orbit or a larger orbit, then we have to do a loop-to-loop. -loop. And, um, and that loop-de-loop -loop is called a transfer orbit. Okay. Finally, um, Lagrange orbits. Now, Lagrange orbits, there are five Lagrange points. These are um, specific areas or regions of, the, um, of space around an object or between two objects here. This one here is between the Sun and the Earth. And there are five points where gravitational forces balance. And if you place a satellite in this orbit, it stays in this position. So the first one of, um, of note is called Lagrange point one. And this is where we have a satellite called SOHO, which is a solar observatory. So we have a solar observatory satellite there. Um, another Lagrange point here is L2, and if you place a satellite in this one here, what happens for all of these, as the Earth goes around in this direction here, these two points stay the same. So if the Earth moves to this point here, if you place a satellite Lagrange point 1, it stays there. At Lagrange point 2, it stays there as well. So even though the orbital radius is really smaller, so therefore this orbit here should be quicker, um, it stays in the same position. In Lagrange point two, it stays fixed behind us. And normally we play, the, the orbit is not a, a single place, it can actually be made to do a loop, uh, a little loop over here. And we, we have often different uses of these orbits. The other three Lagrange points um, exist, uh, one exactly in the opposite direction to L2 on the opposite side of the Earth, so it's L3. Um, at that point there, it will move around at the same way, time that Earth moved around in this direction. And the grains four and five are, form a right angle triangle between the Earth and the Sun, or this could be the Moon and the Earth. And if you place a satellite here, it just wanders around here, this point here. Um, in the same position. And remember, it stays the same distance away from both the Earth and the Sun. So as the Earth moves around, this point here moves around as well. Um, in, if we have Jupiter, if this was Jupiter, just to so clear the annotations, if this was Jupiter and this is the Sun, then there is a significant number of small asteroids that have been collected in these positions here. And they are called the Trojans or Bricks. And so the Trojan asteroids are asteroids which precede the orbit of Jupiter and the Greeks are the asteroids which after it. And the reason why they're called Trojan or Greeks is it is named after famous Trojans and famous Greek warriors. So what do we use them for? Over here we've got at the moment um, Soho in Lagrange point one. And we have um, WMAP in Lagrange point two. These are scientific instruments and we need them to always remain at a certain distance above the surface of the Earth and we want them to travel with the Earth. So as the Earth turns round, 
uh, we want them not to get lost or have a faster or a slower um, uh, speed of rotation or orbit. Um, once again, it doesn't, if you um, have a look at this one here, there's the range point two where we put W map at the moment. This is quite a distance uh, beyond the moon. So it's 1,000 kilometres, 1.5 million kilometres further along than the, the, um, the sun is, um, sorry, beyond the Earth's orbit, current orbit. Um, having a look at the, the range points over here, this is the, the range points between the Earth here and the Moon. As I said, it doesn't fit between any two bodies. Going through them again, um, if I was to place a a point A would be at Lagrange point one, then as the Earth moved, sorry, as the Moon moves around its orbit, then, so the Moon moves here, then the satellite would maintain its position between the Earth and the Moon. At the range point two, as the Earth moves, sorry, as the Moon, I'm going to the same Moon, this is a Moon system here, then the satellite would move here at the same time this moved here. The range four and, and five form a right, sorry, an equilateral triangle, and the range point three form a distant, equidistant base of another triangle. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning Lagrange points is that um, in 2010 the HSC actually uh, mentioned a Lagrange type orbit, and it was uh, it threw a lot of people. So here we've got in 2014, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will be placed in orbit around the Earth, sorry, around the Sun, um, Earth and, sorry, around the Sun. Earth and the w, JWST will follow the orbits as shown. With identical orbital periods, that means it seems to contradict Kepler's law of periods. And what they're trying to say here is, as the Earth moves to this point here, so if the Earth moves there, the satellite JWST moves so that we always have the same um, sectorial position. So there's J and there's the Earth there. Which means that this satellite here has, has a 365 day period. Now, we know that it's further away and we know that according to Kepler's law, as we increase as R increases, the period must also increase. So if we were to put a satellite out here, the w, um, JWST should have a greater than 365 day orbit. But because we put it in this Lagrange point, it moves around with us. Okay? Why is it possible then, is the question, for the w, JWST to orbit the sun with the same orbital period as the Earth? and you must refer um, to Kepler's law in answering this. And it was worth three marks. And um, a lot of people could score one or two marks but not get the third. So let's have a look at what you would need to say is you could mention that you are in a range point, but you need to explain why um, the Kepler laws of period would not apply in this situation. The reason being is for Kepler's law of periods to apply, there must only be one central body or body orbit. In this case, there are two. The uh, satellite is going to orbit both the Earth and the Sun. And therefore, when we are using Kepler's law of periods, uh, the K value would be um, changed because we're not just talking about the Sun, we're also including the Earth. So both the Earth and the Sun's gravitational forces influence the satellite's motion and because we have placed it in a perfect Lagrange orbit, that means that it's a perfect point of balance. Any other point, would, it would not have the same orbit as us or the same period as us. Um, and to, they also required you to say something like this, that Kepler's law equates gravitational forces with centripetal force and the centre of rotation will no longer be the Earth or the Sun. It's somewhere between them. Finally, I want to mention the slingshot effect. This is not truly an orbit, 
but it's a maneuver by which a craft can gain velocity and explore the outer regions of the, um, the solar system uh, by not using up the fuel which is on board. In many cases, we use this with uh, not satellites but probes, which have no internal um, fuel, uh, except for small amounts just to maneuver or um, shift orbits very, very gently. The slingshot effect has a few names by which you might want to just search it on Google. The first one is the planetary flyby, also called the swingby, or gravity assist. So once again, it's a manoeuvre by which a craft gains velocity using the gravitational field of a planet with very little expenditure of fuel. Very simply, what happens is if I have an object, and an object will start to accelerate and fall towards a planet. If the planet itself is also moving, then this object here starts to pick up some of the velocity of the planet. So as the object falls towards the planet, it is starting to pick up and get faster um, by the planet's velocity. If we fall towards the planet, but we slightly miss it, in other words, let's take for instance the most famous flyby position is Jupiter. So we place our satellite or probe out here. We direct it not to fall directly towards the planet, but we directly aim it towards the side of the planet. Now, hopefully Jupiter might be working going off this direction here. As it falls towards the planet, it will gain velocity, getting larger and larger and larger. When it gets towards this point here, we just make sure that we have enough fuel just to push it around and fling it off the other side. So as it gets through here, it increases its velocity and then we just fire a little bit of a rocket first to change its trajectory and off it goes. So it started to gain from a smaller value and then using a small amount of energy um, and fuel we have use the gravitational field of Jupiter to increase the velocity of the um, satellite. When Voyagers 1 and 2 left on their grand tour of the solar system, they behaved just like comets by swimming around the planets. And as the planets were travelling, they gave the Voyagers an increase in velocity. This is known as a slingshot. Navigation had to be exact, so that each voyager would intercept the next planet as it passed through its orbit. This flight pass was the first time we had ever seen the rings of Uranus. By using the slingshot method, each voyager picked up enough velocity to escape the gravity of the sun. Travel on, perhaps to become the satellite of some other star. 